to the show, guitarist extraordinaire, living in the Harry Potter world, the one, <laughs> the only, Uli John Roth. Uh, how are you doing again? How are you today, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Let me just switch this off, the Zoom thing off. So now I'm I'm all yours. Yeah. I mean, okay. the last time we had the pleasure of interviewing you, I've never seen a reaction to a show here on the Metal Voice as strong as that one. Everybody said you had, should have done a 10 part series with you. You were so interesting. Nobody wanted the interview to stop. I remember we had to cut it short. And, it and short. I thought that's when it got interesting. <laughs> that was exactly, that it's probably happening again today. You know, I mean, I find that a lot of, uh, a lot of these interviews, they start slowly, like, why did you leave the Scorpions? Well, <laughs> you know, so you go on and on about, about the same thing. And then when it gets interesting, uh, sorry, time's, time's, time's up. up. Time's up. I mean, we can talk about your decorations from your house. I mean, that's an hour right there. It's so beautiful. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I like it like that. Um, uh you know that that behind me is actually uh, one uh, a copy, but a very good copy of um, of a very good Rembrandt painting, and I love it. And um, yeah, I collect these a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. you, you know what I like about you. You always ha you always take a lot of care in your background. Every time we do a like an interview, last time you were sitting on this chair book, of like a throne. Book. I don't remember what we did last time, but we've got lots of spots in this house, you know. <laughs> and what I I tend to think is when I uh, when I watch a, a YouTube, you know, mm -hmm. and somebody is doing an interview, and it's just like a, a plain white background, I think it, it gets a little um, boring after a time, you know. Being a visual person, you know, like coming from this world of the of, of paintings, um, I think. Uh, it's it just adds to the ambience, you know. If you, yeah, if you have just a, a, a little bit more like a painting, you know, <laughs> you know, as as much as Zoom allows, because the the resolution some sometimes isn't isn't all that good, um, but uh, there's not much we can do about that. Yeah. Well, the cool thing is we've talked about the scorpions so much in the past. Now we're heading off into after post scorpion. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we're we know why you left. We know all that stuff. We've talked about it we so can many close, times. Close that chapter. Let's close that chapter. Let's <laughs> Wait, close that I've, book. I've, I've closed it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so the cool thing is, Electric Sun is being re released on November the seventeenth, and this is Earthquake, the, the album. Yeah, Earthquake I think it's actually. actually uh, I think it's actually November the tenth. But it doesn't really matter, you know, because, I mean, it's not yeah. the year there. Nowadays, it's all like postal order anyways, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so but I sorry guess, to cut you short. So No, no, no. What can people expect, you know, with the re-release? What are they getting that they haven't gotten yes. before? Yes. Um, well, the reason for um, coming up with my own label, which is called Alpha Experium, was to um, tend to my entire back catalog, put it on the market in as vinyl, as all singing, all dancing as it gets, you know, because um, they they have been, uh, a lot of them have been re-released in the, in the past. But for instance, like my Electric Sun albums haven't been out on vinyl you know, since the days, I, I think, probably uh, the 80s, you know. And there are um, quite a few collectors who, who still love vinyl. So we went to very great lengths to go back to the original master mixes and to um, take our master, our digital master from there and get as close as possible to the original 3D kind of sound, you know, which we heard in the studio. Because what tends to happen with all these remastering efforts over the years with a lot of um, albums or a lot of artists, uh, they get remastered again and again from the say or, or from <laughs> from the previous one, and in the end, you just end up with a little bit of a digital um, Mickey Mouse blur, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we went to great lengths to 
to avoid that and to be as truthful as, as possible. Also, um, we dug up, dug up a, a couple of um, really nice uh, jam sessions, which are there as bonus tracks, uh, which were from the recordings and which I had forgotten all about. You know, okay. our um, old drummer Clive Edwards put me on to them, and he said you should listen to that. And he, he had them as like as a um, an old cassette um, deck. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, and but the the quality was good enough to um, you know to treat it and uh, with uh, our master mastering engineers really are uh, quite something. He's uh, you know uh, absolutely superb when it comes to these things and i think he got the best out of it you know so that's there and then the artwork um i put it into a framework that that i'm happy with i was never really happy with how the original looked um particularly the very first one i thought it was awful and didn't do any justice whatsoever to monica's uh, beautiful paintings um and uh, now i think we've also corrected that and I've also uh, made up some interior artwork, which is new, but in the style of, of the days of back then, you know. And gradually, we're going to do this uh, treatment to every single album that I've recorded. Oh, wow. So the next one is almost finished already, which is Firewind. Then there will be Beyond the Astro Skies. Then there will be all the, um, the uh, Sky of Avalon albums, Etc. Basically, all the the stuff I've done, we're going to give it uh, the definitive treatment, and and that's that. You know, that's very very that's cool. I, th I think we've all learned the past week what can be done from a cassette tape uh, with what the Beatles were able to release based exactly. on a little cassette tape, right? That was pretty amazing. I thought, yeah, that was pretty amazing, uh, and. Uh, I thought it was really haunting, you know, and uh, written by John Lennon, typical John Lennon, but I think it was one of his his best, actually. Um, not quite finished, but then you have, of course, Paul McCartney, absolute um, genius in these things, you know, who gave it the works. And you had Ringo and even a little bit of um, um, George Harrison. And I loved when Paul actually did the slide guitar. He did a George Harrison slide guitar solo, you know, like perfect, ding, ding, you know, like it was exactly what you would have expected um, from, from George, you know. I don't know if George came up with that idea, but whoever did, it was just pure gen genius. Yeah, I agree. I loved it. And the ending. You yes, know, that was beautiful. so typically Beatles. Nobody else does that. You know, you the, the song's developing and suddenly it shifts gear and then it's finished. They always had great endings, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I thought it was marvelous. And and they did all that from a crappy little cassette. I don't um, know yeah. what the original um, sounded like, but probably <laughs> pretty dreadful. You I know? With all the bleed through from the piano and your yeah. Yeah. buried vocals, look what they're able to do. So. But let me ask you, Ali. You leave the Scorpions, okay? Here we go and again. We, and we've talked. No, no, we've talked about that. We talked about that. We're not talking. We hey, about I, that already. I must remember to look into that camera because I'm always looking to you, <laughs> and then I'm, you know. So please remind me. I have to look okay. at you. Please look over here. Okay, you yeah. you leave the Scorpions, as we spoke about many many times. Now you're. Were you? In the same time that the Tokyo tapes were released, you're you know you're coming out with this album, Earthquake, right? Yeah. Were you scared? Was there a feeling of I'm excited or I'm scared? Um, what was that sort of sensation you were going through? You when... know, I've never been scared about any release. Uh, maybe I should have, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I wasn't. I I was actually very self confident. Uh, the self confidence of youth. Yeah, you there know, you go. Yes, I yes, guess. Yes. Um, nowadays, I am maybe a little more self-critical, and I wouldn't maybe be quite as self-confident. But then I wouldn't put out anything that that I'm um, really happy with. You know. That reminds me of the great Bob Seger line: "Wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then." <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> 
Yeah. For me, you know, this is probably, were there songs written in your time with the Scorpions and you were just kind of like writing them down and, and would they have been on the next Scorpions album if you stayed? I mean, were these songs uh, kind of circulating in your head? No, not really. There is one instrumental which we just dug up for Firewind. I had forgotten all about it. <laughs> and it suddenly appeared on the master of uh, the, the actual um, multi-tracks. And uh, my manager played it to me over the phone. He said, do you know what this is? And then, yeah, I wrote this so many years ago. All it was was two guitars, rhythm guitar, drums, and bass. But it had a very catchy melody. Um, that could have been a Scorpions one, you know. Um, and we are um, going to include it as a uh, um, bonus track on, on the Firewind um, album where it should be. But no, uh, the Electric Sun material was absolutely not Scorpions material. Had I stayed with one foot in the Scorpions, I would have written more like uh, Cesar Sharon and stuff like that. I would have stayed in that direction, you know. Uh, but the Electric Sun stuff was uh, completely, yeah, a different universe to the Scorpions. Well, a completely wow. different band. I love this album. This was actually one of my favorite albums by you ever. Wow. I, even wow. as a teenager when I first heard it. And when I heard Lilac for the first time, I was like, what the heck's going on here? This, <laughs> this poetry. That and actually, that is actually one of my favorites, but not everybody got tiny it. Tiny flower. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, what, what, is, what is that? Is that like renewal? Is that what the lilac it, is? It, it, well, it, it is really about um, immersing yourself in in the cosmos. You know, it sounds, <laughs> sounds very psychedelic, but you can do these things without drugs, you know, and I did without <laughs> drugs. Um, it's really how you can see um, all of creation, even inside of the chalice of a tiny flower, you know, how this uh, eternal circle uh, uh, cycle of birth and rebirth and uh, how things grow from within, from tiny seeds, they become big, they have a lifespan, they come to a climax, they go into another octave, and then gradually they start to fade and they wilt and make space for the next flower, you know, and probably even the same spot or different spot. But um, yeah, that's kind of what's what's behind the uh, the the text. The because it's, it was a spoken lyric um, yeah. of um, lilac, you know, yeah. I got go ahead, Alan. If you want to, keep no. I'm just wondering with the new releases, are you finding any uh, difference in the vinyl, the quality of the vinyl today, as, as it was in the eighties? That's a good question. Uh, that's it's difficult to actually difficult to ascertain. Yeah. You know, um, I don't even have access to my old vinyls. Uh, they're, they're all in storage somewhere. Um, somewhere like that. Yeah. Well. I know where, but uh, but that storage is sc scary. There's oh. just too much of it, you know. <laughs> I mean, you're talking containers and containers and containers. Oh and, boy! Yeah, I don't even want to go there, you know. Um, hundreds of boxes, um, but uh, yeah, I I'm uh, I'm not sure actually you know we didn't do a one to one test like that uh, probably we should have but then again back then we had there was different equipment you know right. they, they made great strides and uh, uh vinyl always just sounds totally different from digital it has, it has its own quality it's like a filter you know you either like it or you don't you know it's like you okay you have like a a Rembrandt painting, you know, and um, what these guys used to do is they used to paint in layers. So they would do the outline first in almost black and white, you know, um, as an impasto and underneath, and then gradually fill in the colors and then 
putting glazes on top. And these glazes are basically a wash of, say, a certain see-through yellow or whatever, like a, like a photographic filter, you know. And this is very much the same with vinyl. And um, it it's kind of like a, a glaze. And it does something to the sound. And some music, I think, does sound better, you know. Um, but uh, not all of it. And uh, I I think there's a lot to be said about digital as well, particularly when it goes beyond the sound of a compact disc, which is uh, unfortunately still at 16 bit. You know, we we could do it a lot better nowadays, but the infrastructure in the business just isn't just isn't there. You know, nobody seems to be asking for it. You know. There's yeah. no demand. I'm going to get back to the songs from Earthquake. Still so many lives away. Is this your tribute to Bob Dylan? Or I mean, when I hear the song, I think of Bob Dylan. Yeah, thank you. That's always a great compliment. But but it isn't. No. Um, you see, it's one of these songs. It's basically just telling a story, you know, and it is a story about uh, reincarnation. Because I happen to believe in reincarnation. Um, I think there is such a thing as that, that uh, um, we get born and reborn and in cycles, but as very different people, it's not the same. The spirit is the same, but the actual, um, the, the actually the manifestation is different. You know, it depends on where you're born or, uh, who were your parents? You know your uh, your upbringing, the the social surroundings, the culture, and all this. You know, so you could have uh, the same spirit being born in the times of, of Greece or in the times of Rembrandt, like four hundred years ago in Holland, and then materialize again at some other point um, in another life as quite a different human being because I think the personality um, is uh, quite different um, each time around, but uh, the actual substance and the essence doesn't really change. That's the, the spirit of the soul. Yeah. So the, so our body. And uh, so, so many lives away is, is about that. So, so our, our body is a vessel, like you're saying, it's really the spirit that carries on. And that, spirit, and that spirit can be changed over generations each each well, time it's the um the the point to still so many lives away is that uh, he, there's a, a person who keeps making the same mistakes over and over each lifetime which is a i think probably a very common thing <laughs> um and uh you know, if you look for a purpose of life or, or, you know, what we could be or what we should be, what we might be, I happen to think, um, among other things, it's uh, it gives us the opportunity and the possibility to actually progress as a spirit to, um, to a more elevated level, you know, because there are many, many different levels of um, spirituality. And um, they are inside of us as a possibility. But um, some people have the desire, they feel drawn towards that, and they want to, um, you know, uh, have spiritual progress, meaning basically becoming better people, you know, just better persons. Uh, those things go hand in hand, you know. And... Um, uh, sometimes a lifetime it seems like a long time for us, but in in cosmic terms, it's, it's it is a blink of an eye. There is, there is no time in the Back, cosmic universe, right? You know? What is time? So, um, yeah, we, I mean, being incarnated on Earth as a person, we are given a, a great opportunity and a great chance, but uh, also. Um, it comes, I think, with a um, an obligation, you know. I mean, you can either say, okay, I just want to have a good life, you know, uh, like tomorrow, like um, you only live once, etc. You know, if you do that, um, you would probably have to be like, if you're very selfish and if, if you only do what's good for you, 
you will have that uh, life maybe, you know. But um, is that the right kind way to live? You know, I doubt it. Karma. Karma the, comes back to haunt you. Yes. The the idea of karma uh, is a very powerful one. And it's the only one that really makes sense to me when I look at all the chaos that uh, surrounds us in, in, in this world nowadays. You know, um, there are some eternal truths, even if they are maybe very far away for us and, and, and very hard to grasp and they're you know not they don't seem relevant but i think they are there you know um and they go way beyond that watch what um you know we uh learn is right or wrong in um you know in school maybe you know yeah. not that they're teaching the wrong things um they sometimes do i believe but uh there are um, if we really go way, way deep down inside ourselves, we all know what's right or wrong because we've got a conscience. And that's like the divine part of us. You know, even if you're a murderer, you will still have that conscience. And God, very deep down, that little voice will tell you what you did was wrong, you know. And um, then it's up to us to to just listen, you know. Yeah. Just sometimes not so easy because taking the easy way is, uh, yeah, that um, doesn't present many obstacles. You know, sometimes doing the right thing is very, very um, hard and, uh, and difficult and inconvenient and dangerous and you name it, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, to get a long story short. <laughs> That's what that song is all about. That's what that song is all about. <laughs> I've you never know, actually explained it. You're the first one who ever. Well, I, I can ask you for ever. every song, but um, I just want to plug this ask before. That question. <laughs> I want to ask you this question. I want to say this statement. You have a UK tour coming up before we, we get into the next question. <laughs> coming up November the 20th, right? All the way to yeah. November 29th. That's the UK yeah. tour. And then you have a North American tour coming up in 2024. So yeah. I want to make sure to mention that. All right. Now I want to ask you about Monica, Monica Daneman, who you, I, I'm assuming you're married to her, right? Uh, after no, we were, we were not married. We were together for many, many years, but not actually technically married. We should have, I guess, but we weren't. Common law, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. and, and, and what's spectacular about your relationship is like, she had a relationship with Jimi Hendrix prior. It's kind of like this continuity of your, your sound, her presence and the whole, I guess, that sort of Jimi Hendrix vibe, right? I mean, what was your relationship like with Monica? Like, I, if you want to answer that, I don't want to get too personal. Uh, well, it, it, you know, you are asking a, a difficult question here because um, anything with Monica was not one dimensional. Okay. You know, the, she was just actually totally amazing. And um, I was very privileged to um, have uh, known her and to um, be able to be with her. You know, I've never met anybody like her. Um, talking about spiritual, she had that like to the highest degree. Um, so much so that um, sometimes people didn't get it at all. They thought she was like, completely naive and whatever you know because she didn't um she didn't know how to play that um manipulation game with the press and all that you know uh, she took everything at face value and she really wasn't quite cut out for this world i have to say but in her environment she was an artist and but she was much more than an artist in her environment at home it was like um it was just beautiful um she uh, created a um an atmosphere in the house with her paintings which were phenomenal um and of which she had like 200 uh, all together i think um so there were always new ones being produced but they were on all the walls and the house was magical because 
the house itself had we lived in in a in a thatched house in in Seaford uh, right you know you could see the cliffs of the uh, the white cliffs um in the distance from from my studio and uh, she she and her mother rosemary created a magical garden but the house was difficult to describe whenever people came into it so often they said wow this feels like time warp but time warp not in the sense of you know you're just stepping back in time no it was you were in a different time continuum it was a different world altogether and that was what she stood for that was what she represented uh she was a really good person okay um, to me, it's, I, I found it always fascinating that that connection, you know, the Jimi Hendrix, the Monica, and the you, and it's just... It, I it's, think it was destiny. How, how did you meet her? How did you meet her? Like, Yeah, well, um, uh, I saw her once um, when we were with the Scorpions. Uh, we were at a, um, at a concert in, in Dusseldorf, and she happened to be at the same concert. So I saw her from the distance and um, I didn't really know what she looked like, but she had this huge aura from the distance. I could see uh, there was something going on in there. She was shining. She was radiant wow. uh, in a very strong way. And then somebody said, that's Monica Danneman, you know, so I knew that. But we didn't get to talk that day. That was in 1975. Now, in early 1976, we happened to be in the speakeasy because we used to hang out there, the Scorpions and UFO, Michael Schenker and Dita Dirks. We were there one evening. Um, not the not UFO, but Michael Schenker was there and, and Rudolph and, and Dita Dirks. I don't know why. We, we had some discussion. It was, oh, actually, I think, yeah, now I know why. Because we had that day, we had... Um, uh, recorded a, a video in Water Street, uh, just a promo video of um, like an early song, you know, like, um, what was it? Uh, um, I, I think it was Speed is Coming, actually. And uh, yeah, so I was sitting there and suddenly I uh, saw her sitting there, you know, with her girlfriend, you know, having a dinner at, at the other table. And I thought, uh, you know, I didn't know what to do. You know, <laughs> so I was very shy and I was much younger than she was. She was like uh, nine years older. She was like this big wow. glamorous lady, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't know what to do. And then Rudolph said, come on, just go over there, talk to her, you know. So I... I um, uh, asked her if she would like to talk about Jimmy, and she said, sure. And this is how it all started. You know, I gave her the next day uh, we met again at, at the Speakeasy. I gave her our Entrance album. Then she came to see us at the um, at the Marquee Club. And that was that, you know. I mean, you know. Well, it's a good thing you didn't give her a Virgin Killer cover. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but although that was already uh, recorded, but the album hadn't been out yet, you know. <laughs> but it ruined the date. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah that's, uh, so we, that was that. So the, these tours that are coming up, um, you know, what, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, how's that? Uh, how's that going to work? Is you got to. Um, is there a band attached to that? Is there opening yeah, acts? Is it? Uh, there is a band attached. An to evening it. with. <laughs> now we're not doing evening when, but uh, we're doing lots of others. Um, there is a band attached. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're starting in the UK in Cardiff. We're doing ten shows in the UK. Ten, nine or ten, I'm not sure. Um, starting on the twentieth. We're doing a full uh, rock show that evening, but uh, I will also do some, uh, you know, some so solo stuff with my nine string flamenco sky guitar. And uh, 
the American program and the North American program, because we will also come to, to Canada, oh, good. Um, will be a little more extensive because it will be tr two programs in one. We're starting off the evening with an evening with an evening okay. with Julie John Roth, meaning I will um, talk about my new book for about mm. like a TED talk. You know, then I will do some stuff solo and just with the screen and the orchestra, maybe a little Vivaldi, maybe some of my classical pieces. Um, then we do an intermission and then we do the full rock show. Uh, so like it's that. going to be a hybrid. Yeah, I think I think this if, is going if, to if, really if you work. Need, if you need two guys to TED Talk ask you questions we can do that for so, you in Montreal. okay great so that would make my job so much easier <laughs> could ask you the questions me and alan and we could also translate in he's French a pretty easy need. interview i mean yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so that's uh that's basically it in a nutshell you know i mean it it came about uh this hybrid uh idea came about because we had to already postpone the tour twice because of COVID. We had booked nigh on 70, that's seven zero North American show, uh, shows for 2020, I believe. Um, you know, it, uh, solo shows, where which was called Interstellar Sky Guitar, where I was just with the screen and uh, pretty um, ambitious program with uh, lots of new music also. And um, yeah, then thanks to COVID, that never happened. Uh, but we started some of that in Europe, and I really liked it. We only did thirteen shows, and then you know. Well, uh, we last discussed. time, last time you were in Montreal, you did uh, the three-year anniversary or three anniversaries. You did, you got on stage, you did a meet and greet, and then you went on stage and you did just you and to the backing tracks. Oh, there I did the Vivaldi Four Seasons, yeah, but That's that was right. a VIP event. Yeah, you know. Yes, yes. Um, what you we do going? a lot of work. You do a lot of work. Oh my lord! Yeah, I was like five hours a day easily, um, on on that stage, um, in different configurations. Um, we're going to do uh, for the North American tour as a VIP event. We're going to do um, a guitar uh, masterclass before each show, oh, okay. you know, like a one and a half hour event where I'm going to delve deeply into the Sky Guitar. And it'll be different from my normal Sky Academies because it's not going to be esoteric. It's going to be more about guitar playing and music only. And I will uh, utilize my, uh, you know, my catalog, my, my best guitar solos, and use those and maybe take them apart and explain certain uh, ways of, of doing it, you know? So that's what we're gonna do. It hasn't been advertised yet, but it'll become very so, um, shortly. What what about the set list? What's a uh, Scorpions mixed in with? Big uh... set list, big set list. In the first half, I'm playing quite a few unknowns, uh, almost all unknowns. Um, we're also playing several new ones in in the English tour now coming in up, but in America the setlist is going to be even more extensive, you know. And yeah, we will have the regular stalwarts from the Scorpion days, meaning we'll burn the sky in trance and Sail the Sharam will be there. Uh, but uh, we will also go uh, into the electric sundays and i've really reworked uh those tracks um and i think they've uh they've benefited a lot you know uh, just like when we did the scorpions uh songs like we'll burn the sky etc when we're playing them live now they're slightly different to what they were like with the Scorpions, because in the Scorpions, we didn't have that many guitars, et cetera, et cetera. We are still finding our way with some of the, of the material was very new. Mm -hmm. Now we're really on top of it. And, uh, you know, and the interpretation, I I prefer it now, you know. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, give the same treatment to my Electric Sun catalog. Basically keep what's good, 
and uh, get rid of uh, some of the weaker things, you know, including uh, my uh, weakest vocals. <laughs> also, you know, um, yeah, there's also improvement there on the horizon. What do you believe in? Yeah. I'll, I'll, but, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. I was going to say electric sun, the meaning of it all. You know, was it just a cool phrase or was it just? I mean, you know, it's this is again about uh, the sun is the symbol of uh, the beginning of life in, in the entire universe. You know, um, wherever there's um, a solar system, you have a sun at the center and that sun is like the powerhouse which creates the light and eventually um, also all the the higher elements in the spectrum, maybe not our sun, but you know, you have a supernova and that will give you like all the um, higher elements that we need for, for life. Um, it's all about light and electricity. You know, those two things, the, the electricity is basically the flowing of the life force. And if you look at it in metaphysical terms, so electric sun means that, you know, um, that's what it is. And it is a symbol of uh, enlightenment, uh, meaning it's, um, yeah, it's not only life, but it shines in the dark, you know, and uh, wherever things shine in the dark, um, that's usually a good thing, you know. Yeah. Maybe not always. <laughs> well, looking forward to the tour. Our time's almost up. I mean, Uli, yeah. it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Anything we can do to help promote the shows, just let us know. Because just, just go for it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> just go for it, yeah. Is there anything you would like to mention before we let you go? Uh, I, I don't know. No, not necessarily. Oh, your book. Are you bringing your book on tour with yeah. you? To yeah, it's, it's like a 600-page book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we can carry it. It's heavy. <laughs> You're going to need a container just to just to carry the book. Yes, yes. Uh, no, we'll we'll have the book, um, but yeah, this uh, the uh, tour is going to be colorful and, and multifaceted. So please come and join us. So, yeah. so people can buy the book on tour. That's what I want to go. Um, I really hope so. We are uh, trying to finance it at the moment, and it's looking good, but it costs a fortune to qu yeah. to print it uh, in that quantity at that quality, you know. Um, and I don't want to go through a standard publisher because then it becomes just commercialized. And this book is completely free from any commercial aspects as we know it. Uh, it's pure and from the heart, and I want to keep it that way, you know. All right. Well yeah. said. Willie John Roth hitting the tour trail November twentieth, and the book wow. and the and the sorry the re release November tenth. November ten, yeah. Of, and uh, and your new friend. album is coming out when? A new album? When's that coming out? No, you know you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> wow, that's what we do. You don't ask a lady her age. You don't ask Uli. Well, you could ask you a man when the album's coming out. So there is one coming. That's what. The truth is, I've been recording a lot, particularly recently in um, in Cologne at the Dirk Studios, where we did our um, Scorpions albums, mm. uh, all of them in my time, and uh, made really good progress. So there are um, quite a few tracks in the making. Uh, Rather than a complete album, it'll probably be chunks of three at a time that come cool. up, you know. Uh, we're already playing three of those tracks on the next tour, on the English tour. So okay. you'll get them. Um, so team. 2024, we can expect some new music. That's what yeah, you're Yeah, plenty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good news. On that <laughs> note, thank uh, you so much for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you. You're on the very tour welcome. in Montreal. Yeah. All the best and much success on the tour. Thank you.